Hello, everyone. It's Cass. It's Bob. And welcome to the Reconstructing History Podcast. Welcome, welcome. So what are we talking about today? We were talking about wool. We were talking about wool. And how useful an implement it is for the making of the historical and other, not even historical really, but all kinds of clothings. Yeah. Yeah. I, I seem to talk about wool a lot. I you think. do. <laughs> you do. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a, I'm a big wool convert. I, you know, I mean, I really came to understand how important wool is because I was, you know, doing reenactment where you're always wearing wool. But I mean, I wear wool every day, just normally. I wear yeah. wool socks, wool undershirts and, you know, that wool silk blend thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's just I, I I until I came in here to get on online with you, I had a wool pashmina wrapped around my neck. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've I mean, got wool socks that I wear did all day every day. My smart yeah. smart wool modern yeah. socks and they I love them. Yeah, and I mean the pashmina I had on was cashmere. The shirt Ooh, I'm wearing now is swanky. Yeah. Yeah. The shirt I'm wearing now is merino. Um, you know, it's it's uh it's not goat hair. I that's not true. Cashmere is goat hair. Cashmere is absolutely that's <laughs> cashmere is made from goat hair. Um but yeah, I mean this this idea that wool is scratchy and ugly and smelly and stuff like that. I mean my undershirt is wool. <laughs> it's important to it's, know that. Yeah, and I'm one of those people that you know. I mean, earlier I was. I was That's a good place you, to start, though. Let me let, let let me interrupt you and ask you that question. Yeah. Why why is wool scratchy? Um. Well, there are a couple of reasons, and the biggest thing is it's not. <laughs> um, wool is the hair of a sheep, possibly also a goat, possibly a rabbit, but t- typically when we say wool, we mean sheep hair, sheep animal face. hair. Well, a certain variety of animal. And, um, except for rabbits. Forget rabbits. Forget I even said rabbits. Wool and sh- goats and sheep. Okay. So wool is their fleece, their hair. And if you've ever had a haircut, and I know most everyone has, and you leave the salon or barber shop and your neck itches because your barber or stylist didn't properly wipe off all the little clippings off your neck your it's your own hair and it's making you itch right and the reason it's making you itch is because when you cut something you make a, a sharp edge yeah and when your hair grows naturally, it doesn't grow with a sharp edge. It grows, you know, um, I don't know how you'd even put it. If you look at the, the, the ends of tree branches, they're not pointy. They're, right. they're rounded because like the inside, the, the innermost part grows faster than the outermost part. So it's kind of rounded. Yeah. Um, and that's how your hair grows. If you look at the end of a hair, it's not, you know, at right angles. Right, right. But if you cut a hair, it's at right angles. And that cut tickles. Oh, yeah. So so when when we put on a a wool uh, sweater or something like that or a piece of uh, a wool shirt or something like that, Mm -hmm. what we're feeling when we feel itch is the cut-off ends of the hairs. Well, that could be one of the reasons because cheaper wools are processed with machinery that processes cotton. Oh, okay. And the cotton staple is only about like an inch, three centimeters long. But most wool staples are more like six inches. Right. Long. So, so when you process wool on a cotton machine, you have to chop it up. Okay. 
So instead of having, like when you, if you process fleece by hand, you take the whole, you know, ringlet of hair, yeah. basically, and you spin that. So you have a cut end on one end, of course, because that's the place where it was previously attached to the sheep. Um, but you only have one cut end and you spin it. Okay. But if we have to process that in a cotton machine, you throw it into a chopper that chops it up to cotton length. Right. And then you, have, you just have all these cut edges and cut edges tickle. So, so that's, so you have a bunch of cut edges. You, you have the, right. the wool is all chopped up. So it doesn't have, you know, that natural grown end on it. It's all, it's been cut off. So it's, is exactly what you experience when you go to get your hair cut okay. and you come is it she exactly the same thing now is it what i recall reading or being told about some years ago that in uh, wool some wool fabrics are treated with harsh chemicals as well and that can contribute to feelings of discomfort when wearing them yes that's true does that play um, into that yeah i mean wool is commercially available wool is typically treated with anti-moth chemicals because moths love wool and they will eat holes in it and so you know you treat wool with these anti-moth chemicals um lavender works a dream but it smells but, nice so too it smells nice too so they use these chemicals and the chemicals if you're if you're sensitive to those chemicals and if it is a wool that hasn't been properly cleansed those chemicals will irritate your skin oh i see um, okay yeah, so it's not it's not actually that the wool is scratchy. You're you're perceiving itching. You know, you're perceiving scratchiness because your but skin is irritated by chemicals. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And and that can also happen um, if uh, what was I going to say? There's another chemical thing. Oh. Um, one of the things you should know about wool is if you've ever seen a tag in a piece of clothing that says pure new wool, that means it is 100% brand new wool. That implies that other things that say wool aren't new. Okay. And what, what this means is there is a market and a, a very large market for reconstituted woolen goods. So basically you have stuff that was made into fabric or yarn or something else that has now been ripped apart and re respun and woven into wool again. Oh, okay. So you can there there are two two words that you normally see. One is virgin and one is new. And these tend to get used interchangeably i think in europe one means one thing and in america one the other one means the thing virgin <laughs> wool, yeah it's 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 very annoying because they should mean the same thing in both places but they don't um virgin wool is the very first time a sheep has been shorn okay so that is typically thought of as the best wool the softest wool it's the baby wool yeah and well, yeah, it's just like, just like if you're it, it, if you shave, yeah. the uh, the hairs that come in after you shave are coarse and yeah. Or if you've ever had a puppy, puppies <laughs> look here. Are soft. <laughs> puppies are soft, and then you know a year later they're not soft anymore. Yeah, and that's the same thing. So basically, virgin wool is the first shearing in a sheep's life. Okay. Um, but sometimes they also call that new wool because it's new. But what new wool typically means, when, you, it, when a tag says pure new wool, it means that it is 100%, this is the first time that the wool has ever been made into a garment. Okay. So when things don't say that, they can be remade from something else. And this oh. doesn't mean that you know it's a recycled well it does mean it's a recycled garment you know but it could mean it was um you know spun up into into yarn that was never woven into fabric right so they unspun it and used it for another purpose or um it had been uh 
left over from some process and they made it into felt hmm, okay. or any number of things. Yeah. But so basically just wool, the designation wool alone means it could have been used for something else. And sometimes, you know, wool that you've been reconstituting doesn't stick together so well. So you literally add glue to it. <laughs> okay. And this glue can irritate your skin. That makes sense. Okay. So, so there's that. You know, if you're wearing pure new wool, there's no reason why you should, it should be itchy. Mm -hmm. Unless um, it's got, you know, the chemicals. The uh, well, unless it's, things, yeah. Yeah, and, and the better the wool you have, like pure new wool, typically, typically you don't leave, like those chemicals are in there for storage. Mm -hmm. They rinse them out or otherwise remove them by means of a process before they make up the garment. Okay. So, you know. And presumably, you know, things like the your wool, your cashmere, pashmina, they, yeah. uh, because it's, gonna, it, it's going to be worn next to the skin, they yeah. take measures to remove that chemical additive before they sell it. Yeah, that makes and sense, it's, it's yeah. Possible, it's possible that they don't put it in in the first place. Right. I mean, you know, if you're, my, I know my pashmina was made in India. Right. I don't even know if they have moths in India. There, there might not be a moth problem in India, so a why wool, put it in? A wool-eating moth problem. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, yeah, yeah. interesting thought. Yeah, and also there are other ways to keep away wool-eating moths that have nothing to do with chemicals or even lavender. Um, the moths that eat wool, this is really interesting. The moths that eat wool cannot eat through any and cannot eat paper. Right. Like there, are moths, there are moths that eat paper, and they don't eat wool. Right. And then there are moths that eat wool, and they don't have the mouth parts that can eat the paper. And they're not friends, so they don't work together. It's not like the, the, the paper-eating moths will eat through the paper, and then the wool-eating moths will go and eat the wool. Once so, more into the breach, good moths. Yeah. Once more, and they have wall up little, with our mothy dead. No. They have but, a little moth treaty, little moth treaty, and, so that they can go and get this wool. No, it's... Saint, but, um, this today is St. Mothus Mothianus' day. <laughs> <laughs> and every moth who dies with me this day is ennobled by his condition, be he ne'er so vile. Uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was so, that was terrible. So anyway, that it was it was it was pretty it was painful. Sorry, friends. Um, so, so anyway, anyway <laughs> so, so a way a way to protect your wool, and a way that a lot of factories protect their wool is they wrap the boat the bolts of wool in brown paper. Oh, like the grocery store bags, yeah, or butcher paper, or something like that. Yeah, you, you wrap you so you you roll a bolt and then you wrap it in in brown paper. And sometimes, if you buy from a, a wool factory directly from a wool factory like Woolrich, you can buy a bolt and it'll come wrapped in paper. Huh. So when people so, are storing it at home, put if they put it in something like a sealed plastic, I don't know, Rubbermaid tub, something like that. Mm -hmm. They're off cuts or they're, you know, a couple of yards of this, couple of yards of that wool. If you put like a layer of brown paper on it and then sprinkle it with lavender and then seal it up mm -hmm. tight, you'll stand a much better chance of not ending up with moth holes. Well, yeah, you know that I used to do that with all of my... Yeah, I know. I'm we... trying to play it for the audience. You know, I'm trying to be oh, right. slightly professional here. <laughs> yes, yes. Right after that stupid Henry V filk <laughs> okay yeah i'm trying to be professional yeah so yeah that would work that's a great idea wonder where you came up with that one <laughs> i'm just going to keep making this face that's great that's a great face <laughs> podcast listeners won't have any idea what's going on but you know go to youtube watch the watch the film it's a face um so yeah, so where are we now? Oh yeah, so so wearing wool next to your skin. Shouldn't, um, shouldn't be itchy optimally unless you actually legitimately have an allergy to it, right? Yeah, and, and wool allergies are really, really rare. They're rarer than we think they are because a lot of people think they have a wool allergy 
and they don't. Like they just assume because it's because they start to itch or maybe they get hives or something like that because of the chemicals yeah. or something, right? Yeah. Huh. yeah. Or also or also just because like if you have if you have dry skin and if if the wool is at all um uh like rough. Right. Anything is going to make your dry skin oh, feel sure, itchy. Oh, sure, sure. Because you have dry skin. Right. Um, but, I mean, I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, I can't wear wool next to my skin. I have to wear something under it. And so so I wear, you know, a, a cotton T-shirt or a linen shirt or something under my wool, and then I'm fine. If you can wear something under your wool and your wool stops bothering you, you are not allergic to wool. Okay. Um, and I, I read this on a medical site. <laughs> so it has to be I, true. <laughs> I don't know. I will put it. I mean, it, a, a reputable medical site. It's yeah. not just like WebMD or something like that. Drop, um, drop I will, a link here. I will put a link. I will put a link in the description box. Um, because so many people think they're allergic to wool and, and they're denying themselves a wonderful fiber you know and i I'm not, I'm not having a gun to anyone's head i mean the less wool somebody else wears the more wool in the world i can have <laughs> <laughs> but it it's i really feel sorry for people who think they're allergic to wool because their experience of wool has been some hunting socks that were you know reconstituted from 57 different times or yeah, yeah. something with chemicals and you know a a, a, a sweater that had i mean i've had polyester sweaters that itched yeah terribly yeah um and i mean you know you can tell the audience i have incredibly sensitive skin oh god she like, bruises like a grape yeah and i mean you could literally i went for an allergy test and the the allergist you know they do that thing on your back where they scratch and yeah. put the allergy scratch in. test yeah and he said, this isn't going to work. And I said, what do you mean it isn't going to work? He said, well, you're reacting to the scratches before I've put any of the allergens on them. <laughs> so you look like you're allergic to everything. And, and that's just not possible. And Because he did a couple of tests with no allergen. Right. And, um, and so in order to diagnose my allergies, they sent me for a blood test huh? to see if I had, you know, uh, an antibodies. I don't know to um yeah and it turns out i'm allergic to dogs which i have dogs <laughs> i just i'm apparently i'm allergic but i'm not allergic enough to have a symptom but you know i'm allergic to some cats right um but but yeah so like um one of the things that people tend to be allergic to if you if you were allergic to sheep if you go to a petting zoo and you pet sheep and it makes your eyes water and your face blow up and get red. You're allergic to sheep, but you're not necessarily allergic to wool. Okay. Um, so if you get the lanolin because, out, it'll yeah, help to because, attenuate that? Yeah. Um, you. There are a lot of people who, who do what you call spin in the grease. You, you spin wool that hasn't been washed because it does give a, a weatherproofing to the wool. Okay. If you spin with the lanolin intact, it's very nice. But most clothing has the lanolin removed. Right. So, um, because after all, lanolin is an animal fat and it, it will get rancid. Mm, yeah, yeah. So most, most wool clothing has the lanolin removed. So if you're, if you're allergic to sheep, if you react, have an allergic reaction to the animal, you know, be careful that the wool you buy has been rinsed but most garment wool i mean you might have to be careful with wool that you buy in a fabric store but but most garments that are made up unless there's something like socks um they've had the lanolin removed because there's no reason to leave it in there right it's, it's right not, why would you it's not something you want. i mean it's something you want for its weather weatherproofing qualities but most clothing you don't care about that so like an Aaron sweater that was made knitted by someone's grandmother from the sheep there on Craggy Island. Yeah. That that might still have the lanolin in it, but Yeah, but most Aaron sweaters, I mean, I don't know about you, but the Aaron sweaters that I have are like merino wool. Yeah. And merino sheep aren't 
from Ireland. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. No, they're, they they import the fleece from Italy. They knit them in Ireland. Right, right. Not, the yarn not, comes uh, in on a on a boat. Yeah. Um, so okay. But, yeah. They, so if someone if someone thinks mm -hmm. that they can't wear wool, what steps can they take to try and figure out why they can't wear it? Well, the first thing I would do. Coffee time, excuse me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you you drink coffee while I explain. Um, the first thing I would do is I would I would get I mean it, it's it's expensive for a test, but okay, find a friend who has a merino undershirt. <laughs> 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 and try on the merino undershirt and see see if you react to it. Because like I said, I'm I'm sitting here, you know, wearing a merino undershirt right now and it's it's glorious what about you know, a wool shawl like your pashmina something like that yeah um a pashmina now you have to be careful there because you have to have to look at the tags my pashmina is cashmere right which is really good right but you could have a pashmina that's like you know 10 percent wool and 90% a bunch of other shit. Oh, okay, yeah. So, well, okay, so you, of course you have to look at the tag. I mean, that goes yeah, yeah. that goes without saying. Yeah, I mean, often people think pashmina is a kind of wool, and oh, it's I'm, not. I'm, just, I'm, I'm using, I'm, don't, you're, you're hung up on the, the, the term for the garment rather than what the garment's made out of. It could, could be, because a merino shirt is going to be a hell of a lot more rare than a wool scarf, is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, a wool scarf, I mean, the finer the wool the more likely you are not to react badly to it or like an italian suit oh yeah you know, an italian suit that you go oh my god that must be silk because it shines and no it's wool. you look at the bag and it says 100 percent new wool and it's it's wonderful that's going to be our it... segue so mark that spot so what go, go, uh, about the italian wool suits oh, okay. go on then why are we going to talk about mules? Well, maybe. In <laughs> insert pictures from the internet here right. of the fashionable Italian mules. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult because there's a lot of shitty wool out there. I won't yeah. lie to you. There, there's a lot of shitty wool out there. And... Um, you know, I mean, I've had socks that were horrible. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, they were cheap and they kept my feet warm. So, at least like, in, they the, shrunk. if you get the nicest, finest wool you can find mm -hmm. and you, your itching is minimal and your eyes don't puff up, it's safe to say you're not allergic to it. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Then you can work because with finding a, a happy. So uh, you can find you can work with finding what forms of wool that you can tolerate in yeah. terms of comfort. Yeah, and and I I mean people just kind of grow up thinking wool is scratchy, so I think they just avoid it. I don't think they've I right. don't think they've had an experience of it. We should probably you know? back up. And talk about why we're discussing wool in the first place. I oh, mean, it, because it well, it, and versatility was one of the things that we talked about in the show prep. Because yeah. it's it's such a it's such a uh, it's, it's renewable. It's it, it 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 keeps you warm even when you get caught in a downpour. Mm -hmm. um, it actually goes up in temperature when it gets wet. Yeah, so, I mean, it, there are many great reasons to wear it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and for our purposes, with uh, reconstructing history and historical clothing, especially, you know, uh, pre-1900, it's pretty much the staple outerwear fabric. Yeah, I mean... Until the uh, American viscose comes into wide circulation and, you know, nylon and rayon in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, and I know you're not making a joke by saying it's the staple, but it's the staple. 
Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I should have claimed that one. Yeah, <laughs> but um, no, it really it is. It is. It's warm when you need it to be warm. It is cool when you need it to be cool. Right. It breathes. It sheds water naturally. Sometimes, but. It sheds water naturally. Don't sometimes me. All right. I mean, I'm not saying it gets. I don't. I'm not saying I, it doesn't I, get. There, wet. There's a difference between a, a 17th century cassock made with melton that still has a lanolin in it, and that Italian suit you were talking about earlier. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but even the Italian suit, if you get caught in the rain in your Italian suit, the water will will bead and roll off of it first. You'll get wet. But if you just get sprinkled on you yeah. won't get i just i just don't want i just don't want the, our mouths to write checks that the wool can't cash you know it oh, no. you know the, the the undershirt that i'm wearing right now it gets wet yeah but it you know the first drops it, it takes a bit to get it's like my hair you know well, you stick my head into the shower and it takes a half an hour before you jumped into works. the pool and come out and your hair is still dry at the roots yeah, Ladies and gentlemen, like, she is ridiculous. I look like a sheep. <laughs> um, like a... So yeah, that, that that that's why I was saying about the Italian suit segue that there mm-hmm. are how there are umpteen different kinds of wool, mm-hmm. and the the one point I really the reason I bring it up is the one point I wanted to make is that they're not a, they're not really interchangeable. I mean, you can't make like to continue my metaphor you can't really make a uh, 17th century musketeers cassock out of italian wool suiting no it's it it's it's not made for the purpose right you know? and, and by the same token you don't want to make a modern three-piece suit out of felted wool melton <laughs> with the lanolin in it no, you wouldn't be able to walk. Yeah, you look, you look like uh, what's his name with the Red Rider BB gun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The little exactly. kid. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's important I think because a lot of folks they think they're allergic to wool, and or it's hot, mm-hmm. so I can't wear wool. And sometimes you know you you we talk about well go ahead and make it out of gabardine. Or something like that. And there's Mm -hmm. times when I think that doesn't exactly work. Yeah, I mean, there are times when it doesn't exactly work. Because because a wool that that has been woven in order to be um, very flexible and flowy. Like gabardine. Like gabardine. It doesn't work when you're trying to make something that needs to have body. Yeah. Like a doublet, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, particularly early doublets, like 15th century doublets, before you start putting in interfacing and pad stitching and all those kind of things. That yeah. Around, you know, the end of the 16th century, you the thing has to stand up on its own. Yeah. And um, and you can't you can't make it out of gabardine. Because yeah. Like, just... I remember for a long, long time. And if we can find the pictures, maybe we'll drop them in here in an inset into the YouTube video. There was a. I wore a dark green, like bottle green, gabardine yep. uh, doublet and breeches suit. And it mm-hmm. never, it was never right. It yeah. never, fe- the only reason it had the right look at all was because I've got my own built in peace god. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, and it just didn't work. It just didn't work yeah. right. It should have been, but, but I had some other doublet and breeches suits that you had made out of uh, wool flannel that remember that pistachio green yeah, wool pistachio flannel. Also yeah. Also thinking of your little boy blue. Yeah. Outfit out of metal. Yeah. Of that was, that was just gorgeous. And speaking of, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that, that cassock that went with that, at that outfit, Oh, you could stand in a downpour and it would just be like water off a duck's butt. Yeah. Ask yeah, me how exactly. I know, <laughs> but yeah, there, it, it, using yeah, the appropriate I, wool for the appropriate purpose yeah is one of the things i wanted to make sure we emphasize yeah and and i mean people tend to think of wool as being one thing but there are probably a thousand varieties of sheep 
Right. And they've all been bred for different reasons. I mean, some of them are meat sheep. But yeah, they don't a make very of, good wool, right? No, the meat sheep, the meat sheep make horrible wool. I mean, you could make it into blankets and rugs and stuff, but you you wouldn't want you wouldn't want it to touch you, you know? It's right. just not not soft. Um, but then, you know, on the other hand, there's merino. Right. And merino is lovely because not only is merino soft and fine, but it's antimicrobial. Like you're I mean, I have literally worn this undershirt on one of our long walks mm -hmm. and, you know, come home all sweaty. And I hung the undershirt on the towel rack in the bathroom because I was going to hand wash it. And when I went to hand wash it, it didn't smell. Yeah, it was just fine. Yeah. Your armpits and the, did not stain it. It just, yeah. yeah. And the reason for that is that um, Merino has natural antimicrobial part properties. And the reason your sweat smells, your sweat doesn't smell by itself. Your sweat smells because bacteria grows in it. Right. So if the bacteria doesn't grow in it, then it doesn't smell. And so, um, so Merino has this amazing property. Right. And yeah, you know, it, instead of smell like a wet sheep, you don't smell like anything at all. And it's, and it's still, you know, insulating and yeah, yeah. And wonderful. So, you know, and uh, my socks have some merino in them too. So yeah. your feet don't get stuck. It's, it's terrific stuff. It what really is, is great. Complete, complete uh, topic change here. But what is the, what's the deal with wearing a layer of linen or a couple layers of linen, like a linen shirt and a linen lining under your mm -hmm. wool? There's something about temperature regulation. Tell me about that. Well, I don't know that that's ever actually been proven. Oh, okay. Um, because we found a number of uh, archaeological survivals wool that don't appear. I mean, okay, caveat here. The kind of soil, acidic soil preserves wool acidic soil rots linen oh yeah very quickly so, yeah so you'll find uh what used to be a garment made out of wool that was sewn with linen thread and the linen thread will be gone right um but that being said the holes are still there where the stitches were so you know oh there was thread here and clearly it was linen thread where wool thread would still be there um, if there were a linen lining of these garments, you would have evidence of that lining. Right. And I have, I have studied a lot of wool garments that have been pulled out of the ground, and I cannot think of a single one that had a linen lining. Oh. So this is something we do as reenactors. Now that's not to say they never line things with linen. Um, but it's something we do as reenactors that I think we've we've created a reason or there's a modern reason. Yeah, or you know, that, that, we, that we push back backwards in the timeline from eras that where we know because we have got extant stuff that still has the linen lining. We push yeah. it back farther than we really should responsibly do out of assumption. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but, I mean yeah, I've, and it does make sense in the modern context too because, you know, we're not dealing with we're a lot more fussy about washing stuff yeah and uh you know it makes it makes sense to protect your wool that you don't want to mess about with because oh dry clean only or some nonsense like that that and there's another video for that that yeah there'll be a link I'll, I'll hard on the youtube video somewhere um, YouTube. but the uh so we put a lining in to protect the expensive wool Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, so yep. the temperature regulation thing, I guess, was just a, like a reenactorism that stems from, you know, my personal experience that, 
it it makes sense to me. But if there's if there's never been anything to prove it, then I guess I'll just not talk about it. And also, you know, don't forget that we're reenacting mostly people who lived in Europe, yeah. who lived in quite a climate that where we did in Pennsylvania, yeah. where it's boiling hot in the summertime. Yeah, because we tended to congregate in those eras that had the, what the Maunder and the Spur or Minima. Yeah. So, yeah, things when, yeah. when the, we have all, all those paintings of Dutch people skating on the canals because they were frozen solid. Yeah. And that's, exactly. that takes a lot. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's only been in recent years that it's gotten really summer hot here yeah. in Europe. I mean, in, in Northern Europe, in, in the Netherlands. So um, it, it's quite a new thing. You know, no one has air conditioning. Um, yeah, they're starting to. Many splits are becoming very popular. They're starting to because, you know, the temperature is changing, the climate is changing. But um, There's a way to track yeah, global so, warming and climate change. Yeah. When the Dutch buy AC units. Yeah, the, the Dutch buy AC units, you know something's wrong. You can probably track um, it by degree average increase year yeah. on year. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, the, the month before they turn their air conditioning on, they're still heating their pools. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, it's not to say that they never lined wool with linen. But I think I think we make this huge assumption um, based on what we think makes sense. Yeah. And th the reality is medieval people were better at being medieval people than we are. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they were so, born to it. Yeah. And so since you kind of got close to this topic um, and we've we've done a video on this, which I will link, but um, let's talk a little bit about cleaning your wool okay um typically in most time periods that we're talking about and when i say that i i do include the 20th century you didn't wash your wool yeah and modern people kind of go oh that's disgusting but it's not no um you know i don't wash my tweed jackets why would you well, then again, we, we did a video on it. Yeah. I don't wash my Aaron sweaters. At the same time, it, it it's... I, I remember the um, recommendations to... Like, if, if you have... If, if you get scratchy sensations mm -hmm. when you make a thing out of wool, like a doublet or something, in the, in the historical slash reenactment context, the advice is to wash the hell out of it before you cut it. Oh, wash the fabric. Yeah, yeah wash the fabric, you know, to wash the hell out of it. I mean, yes, it'll felt up a little bit just from the agitation, but would wash it on hot, as hot as, as, hot as you can um, in order to get all of those processing and anti-mothing chemicals out of it. Yeah, well, that's one thing. And the other thing is that to make good garments, and this is, this is the thing, this is where modern manufacturing really pisses me off. In order to make a proper garment, you should wash the fabric before you cut it. Right. Because... Why you know, do that, though? They're... In modern ma manufacturing, you're just adding an expensive step. Put that on the customer. And then spin off another side, another business in the economy, in the service economy of dry cleaning. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, a lot of the tags... I remember when my mom worked in a garment factory, and a lot of the clothing they put tags in that said dry clean only weren't dry clean only at all. Yep. It was just that they did not want to be held responsible for if the garment shrunk if you washed it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And we're so used to um, cotton. Yeah. And cotton shrinks, you know? <laughs> yeah, tell um, me about it. I've got I've had some really t-shirts I was really proud of that I wore once. Are you sure? They shrunk? And it wasn't you getting bigger? Oh. Podcast listeners, I'm making a face. Oh, me. <laughs> yeah, you're oh. 20 years, 20 years in four days? Three days. Three days, that's right. <laughs> Three days. <laughs> oh, my God. That's I know, right? right? 20 um, years. Yeah, so, so, you know... One of the reasons that you do that 
as a reenactor is, yeah, to get all the chemicals out and, you know, fabric sits on shelves. You want to get all the shop dust off of it. And, yeah. And things all the like things that, that could irritate you. Yes. Um, but the other reason and, and, and to get it to get the shrink out of it. Yeah. But one of the other reasons you do it is that modern wool tends to have a finish on it. Yeah. Um, because we make it into modern garments that we want finished a certain way. Yeah. And we want to wash that fit. We want we want our reenactment wool to be a little fuzzy. Yeah, it's like getting the sizing out of linen. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And um, so that's that's one of the reasons that we wash it. And another thing I, I, I want to mention is that washing something on the hottest temperature you've got is not what shrinks the wool. It's washing it on the hottest temperature you've got and then rinsing it on cold. Plus the agitation of being in yeah. a washing machine with an agitator. You're literally um, felting it. Yeah, it's, it is the shock. Yeah. It is the shock of hot than cold yeah. that makes fibers kind of... We well, do the same thing uh, when you jump in the pool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Your fibers shrink too. Um, <laughs> I was in the pool! Yeah, Why do you think they become short and curly? <laughs> yeah, the, oh. The, the, the curl you know, shrink up and then they kind of lock together because the heat has made the cuticle of the hair open up. And then when you shock it, they don't just close up nicely. They close up and they stick to each other. Uh, okay. And and that's what felting is. Yeah. You know, so, so when you, when you shock. Oh God. Yeah. I remember there was, was it that scarlet wool we had? I forget where we got that from. But it, when, when it started, it was a nice... I was going to make a, uh English Civil War era soldier's coat out of it. So I decided to wash it. And mm -hmm. wash it I did. And it went from this nice wool flannel to like, I don't know, four or five millimeters thick. Like a quarter inch thick. It turned into a blanket. I mean, I, I didn't... Yeah. It's, we used it as a blanket. We took it with us to yeah. events. Because we had this, it was going to be enough to make uh, a suit, a uh, soldier's coat and a pair of breeches, and it shrunk to something you would use as a blanket on like a single, a, a, a child's cot. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing with how we normally buy wool. We don't go to you know, a store that specializes in wool. We go to a store that specializes in selling bolt ends for manufacturing. So you don't know, and, and most of them aren't labeled. Yeah. So you don't know what you're getting. And, and labeling it, and labeling because it, it, especially in most areas of commerce, it isn't regulated. And there, yeah, well, there are things that people can say 100% wool, and it's really not. It's got some well, nylon yeah. content. Yeah, you can you can have up to 10% nylon content and not admit it. Yeah, and call it 100% wool. The hell. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but if you go but, to some place, we should we should put a list of. RH approved suppliers oh, in, yeah. the, in the doobity doo um, at the, the end of the, in the, in the, the show notes and all that, like be black and sun and stuff like that. Yeah. Places to yeah, get wool that you know what you're, you're getting. Yeah. And, and this is the thing. I mean, be black and sons, they're, they're a tailoring supply. So they, they order from wool manufacturers, Yeah, but most stores you go to, like the store that we used to go to in Lansdale, they don't even think it's there anymore. They used to buy bowl tins. Yeah. So they didn't, they were getting and there were a couple times when they were like oh this is linen i'm like that's not linen but it's not that they were trying to sell you something you know they were trying to sell you something falsely it's that they really didn't know because it comes in they buy you know a truckload of bolt ends yeah and they don't know what they've got they get and, what they get and, yeah and the manufacturer is obligated to reveal what's in the product to the first customer to the customer who buys it new, which is the factory. Yeah. But the factory, when the factory sells off the bolt ends, they're not obligated to disclose. No, no. Oh yeah. Linen. That's uh, that's linen. Yeah. That's uh... honestly, they've got these big 500 yard rolls on their machines and they end up with, you know, 20 yards at the end that they sell to the bolt store. They don't remember what roll right. came off of it. You know, just roll it up on a bolt and sell it on. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. 
and that's why they're not obligated to disclose yeah. everything about it because it's it's been lost to them yeah and it's a hell of a lot better than just throwing it in a landfill although the wool would decompose unlike most of your discarded um, clothing uh, but if the away. landfill was acidic <laughs> true it's true you have to throw it only in alkaline landfills <laughs> that's a fan not a bog yeah a fan not a bog <laughs> if it's acidic it's a bog if it's alkaline yeah. it's a fan there we go if it See? has trees in it it's a swamp if it doesn't it's a marsh really yes wow is that is that your Dungeon Master lore. That that is what you run into when you're googling shit to write <laughs> stuff for for role playing game supplements. You have to be very very specific, very because sp there's one guy, or yeah. maybe a half a dozen, who will come at you on Twitter. Yeah, that's not a fin. That's a swamp. <laughs> a bog is acidic. A fin <laughs> is alkaline. You know, wow. Yeah, yeah. No there's another. There's another thing for tidal for freshwater versus salt water that I can't remember off the top oh, of my head. I thought that was marsh and swamp. No, but. swamps have trees. Marshes yeah. don't. And there, but there's one for salt versus fresh. And I, huh? If you know, ladies and gentlemen, drop it in the comments. I'm happy to know because I. Yeah. I have to add these tidbits of useless information to my repertoire. Yes, why not? So I think so, yes. that's going to about wrap it up for this one. Yeah, and um, I'm I'm being encouraged to do some some uh, Instagram posts on different kinds of wool and their properties and what yeah, they're used for. I think like you that. should, and I think when I get back to civilization, I'm going to pull out because we have some Melton. And mm -hmm. my uh, my pea coat that I my German Navy surplus pea coat that I bought for super cheap is a very lovely winter coat, but it's not wool. It that says it says it's a wool blend, but it's pilling like the worst kind of polyester, and it's not. It's seen better days. So we've got some Melton stuffed in a tub somewhere, and we have that reefer pattern. What's the number of it? Oh, nine twenty nine. No, that's a waistcoat. That's a that's good. Um, nine twenty four is the tuxedo. Nine twenty three. Maybe. Anyway, it's a, it's a reefer jacket. It's a pea coat. So yeah. you'll you'll get to see me hacking my fingers off, trying to make one of these things. <laughs> Well, wonderful! You could do a tutorial on. I could I could teach some of the tailoring techniques that we mentioned in the pattern. That yeah, that's that's kind of the point. Like how here's how to make this collar lay right. That kind of thing. We'll we'll catch up with that. But yeah, wool is wonderful. I, wool is great, and you should always use it. I love you in a pea coat, so that would be nice. Yeah, be nice but maybe I'll get a haircut, and oh, I keep yeah. I can keep the beard because you know. No, Dalton's. Dalton's down in the in the village is waiting for you. Oh yeah, Dalton's oh, yeah, yeah. Cause, they're waiting for you. Oh, they're gonna harvest a hell of a crop from me when I get back there. Cause yeah, I'm not. Yeah, going. there's this barber shop. There's this barber shop in town, and you know the the guys, the Dalton brothers, run the barber shop, and they've got like their entire arms tattooed, and they they both have you know their their hipster beards and their short haircuts, and they do. Um, you know, full shave with the hot towels and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you know, good old old fashioned barber shop with you have your own mug with your own brush in it that you use when you come in. <laughs> so, Ooh, you know, daddy wants daddy wants. So, you know, when you when you decide to come back. Yeah, right. Oh, and speaking of which, well, we'll talk about it after we go off air. But um, good news on that front. Um, Wonderful. So yeah, that's that's all I could think of to talk about with wool, and we're right up running up against an hour here, so oh, wow. we <laughs> should. Uh, once I edit it down, it'll probably be like forty-five minutes. But anyway, yeah. So shall we? 
goodbye to the good folks? I think we should. And be on the lookout for more awesome sauce from us. Do the whole, you know, like, subscribe, ring the bell, um, you know, follow us on social media, blah, 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 blah. We appreciate yep. it. We have, fun, we have a great deal of fun talking to you as well. We love you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Right.